Right, hello one, good evening, uh, or good day. Hope you're all well, and uh, today I'm teaching with Marcos. How are you going, mate? How's it going, Mubu? How are you going, everyone? Good to see you all. Yeah, Gilad couldn't be here today, but uh, he'll be right back with you next week. And it's a very exciting lesson today, right? Abs absolutely, because we are on Zoom. Okay, so <laughs> we've got Zoom today, and isn't that wonderful? I'm really excited. As you can see, I'm able not to hide it. And uh, hopefully we'll carry on like this. Now today is going to be a test session, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to make sure we got we get our you know hands hands on this thing called Zoom. Uh, and unfortunately, I'm not a very techie guy, um, so Marcos will be doing the honors, and he will advise you on how to use this stuff. Marcos, what we're going to do with Zoom? Yeah. Firstly, I mean, it's already great just being able to see, see so many of you, see like all your great faces, that we're not just uh, names on the, on the text anymore. I mean, this is already one great benefit of Zoom. I'm sure now you can also watch from your phone, from your tablet. Before it wasn't uh, as simple. Uh, we've used it to this platform before in other languages and, and it's, it's, it's a great platform. So. Just, uh, I'm, I'm glad you're all using it and getting used to it if it's your first time using it as well. Uh, one of the main reasons we want to use it though is not just to be able to see each other and, and you know, have a good time like this, but one of the really big important parts of the method is the workshop. We're not going to get into a workshop today. We'll kind of discuss what it is. As Motlu said, it's going to be more of a test session. But the workshop is something that we do regularly as Kabbalah students, as friends. Uh, we, we basically get asked questions from the teacher or even you can raise questions among yourselves. Workshops can be done in any context, not just in the context of a Kabbalah lesson. And we, we take those questions and we run them around a circle. Usually workshops are thought of and done as discussion circles where people sit physically. If you think back to even the first Kabbalistic groups like where Abraham was bringing people into his tent and teaching them or Rabbi Akiva teaching people you know, under, under a tree out there. It's always been taught you know, orally from, from teacher to student where they, they would gather and discuss the things together with their teacher. That, that's been the way Kabbalah has taught, been taught for generations. So workshops is the is a natural continuation of that tradition where uh, we literally sit down together in a circle and there's a question and we d discuss the question. However, there are a few rules to that discussion to make sure that, it's, uh, that, that the discussion is adhered to the spiritual laws and that the discussion actually aids us to uh, feel a deeper connection among each other and literally rise spiritually and, and, and reveal that special force, the, sports, the force of the Or Makif, the surrounding light, as we undertake that discussion. We'll be talking more about that, about what those rules are later in the lesson. As we said in this lesson, we're not going to get into a workshop. What we will do later in the lesson, uh, Mutlu is going to start giving the content of the lesson. And you'll be able to simply ask questions uh, from your mics. We'll test that out first. So when it comes time to asking questions, feel free to like put your hand up and, and we can go to you. Just letting you know in advance, we can't really see your names out there, so we'll kind of have to point you out. We'll, as we said, it's a test period, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, also, we might ask you as well. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll also see if any one of you just want to answer the question according to how you according to how you see it and we'll, we'll give it a bit of a test like this later in the lesson maybe if you um open the zoom link on your computer you might be mm -hmm. able to see their names actually i was just thinking okay um like you know like you're joining the zoom link yeah i might actually do that yeah there you go so there the zoom you. links on the screen I'll, right. I'll get in there right here as well Okay. And uh, yeah, take it away. All right, guys. So today we're going to study from Rabash, Rabash's article, and it's called, it's actually on page 68. So if you've got your books, that'd be lovely if you could open it up. You know, we love to go with the book. So make yourself a Rav and buy yourself a friend. That's the first um, article. It's number one. There's two of those. So um, there are two, and we're going to study the first one. So 68, make your, page 68, make yourself a Rav and buy yourself a friend, number one. Now, before, before we get into the nitty-gritty nitty of the article, I just want, maybe we'll just do a little introduction about the article. 
actually, let's do a bit of an introduction about the, the, the whole process that we've been through, right? So this is the intermediate semester. And from now on, um, you guys are now in this new route where we're trying to start getting to work as a group, all right? And this is the whole idea with the Zoom as well. So even though we are all virtual, uh, we may be in different places, the whole idea is that we start to have some kind of a sensation of being together as a group. Um, and in order to attain spirituality, just like in order to attain anything in life, what we need to do, what, we, what do we need? We need a goal, right? Okay, we need, to, we need to want something. We need to want to have a goal. Uh, and the Kabbalists are very pragmatic. They look at this world and they understand that if, if somebody wants to attain something, that attainment needs to be some kind of a goal. And I need to have the tools to get there. So if I want to make a boat, obviously I'm going to want to have a goal of making a boat. And I'm going to have to make a list of things. Right? I'm going to have to make a list of things of what I need in terms of tools and in terms of materials uh, in order to make that boat. And for us, spirituality is no different than actually any other goal that a person might have in this world. So if I have a goal, what I need to do is I need to first define it. So if being a Kabbalist has become miraculously my goal in life, okay, which is wonderful, um, then I need to kind of look at myself and now think, well, of all the things I've learned with the group, with the learning center, the education center that we have, the lessons and the congresses and everything, what do I need to do to kind of build myself in that, in that line, in that, to attain that goal? And today what we're going to be talking about is very important because in order to get to a certain goal, I'm going to need those tools in order to attain my goal. And in Kabbalah, these are very, very important. Now, the one thing that's really different from attaining a corporeal goal and a spiritual goal is this. In corporeality, I see pretty much what I'm going to attain. In spirituality, it's a bit airy-fairy. Well, not a bit airy-fairy, very airy-fairy. But in order to make that airy-fairy thing a reality, just like a scientist wants to reveal something that's airy-fairy for him, we're going to have to use all the tools we have in order to make this thing very important for us so that just like in a corporeal um, you know, venture where, where something is important and we want to attain it, we need to make spirituality very important and inspiring so we don't you know, jump off the bandwagon, as they say. So let's start with, with this article and let's try to get from this the best that we can in order, to, in order to understand what the tools that we need are in order to attain our goals. So Rabash, Social Writings, page number 68, make yourself a Rav and buy yourself a friend, a fundamental article about how we apply this method. So any questions? Are you able to see their names when you're in Zoom? Yep. Oh, That's great. Exactly. So any questions? Just one you... thing as well, quickly. Yeah. Um, uh, it could be beneficial. There's two kinds of views in Zoom. There's a gallery view and speaker view. Gallery view makes us see everyone all at once. Speaker view focuses on uh, where the audio is coming through the microphone. So uh, I find that it, it's a better focus if I put it on speaker view. That way you can kind of focus more in on the, on the lesson. If we're going into something like a workshop, then you can always switch to gallery view. So that's in the top uh, right-hand corner, the, the selection of those views. So you can just click at the speaker view, and then you'd have uh, the, whoever's speaking uh, filling up the speak screen. All right, and if I ask a question, which will be lovely for a change, okay, you guys can put your hands up, and then we can see you, and then Marcus, you do the choosing, because you can see the names and I don't, okay? And that would be nice. We'll have an interactive session, okay? So let's take it easy and, and go. Now, if there's anything technical like stuff you, you might not know, these words, you know, come up. Um, we'll also go over them, but don't be shy. You can ask anything and let's make this session a nice one. So, in the Mishnah, Avot 1, Yeshua ben Perachia says, make, your, make for yourself a Rav, a great teacher, and buy yourself a friend, and judge every person favorably. We see that there are three things here. One is make yourself a Rav, two, buy yourself a friend, and three, judge every person favorably. 
This means that besides making for himself a rav, there is something more that he must do in relation to the collective. In other words, engaging in love of friends is not enough. Additionally, he should be considerate towards every person and judge them favorably. We must understand the difference in wording between make, buy, and favorably. Making is a practical thing. This means that there is no mind involved here, only action. In other words, even if one does not agree with the thing he wishes to do, but on the contrary, the mind makes him see that it is not a worthwhile deed, this is called doing, meaning sheer force with no brains since it is against his reason. Okay, this paragraph is important, so I'll mark this. Accordingly, he should interpret in relation to the work that the fact that one needs to assume the kingdom of heaven is called an act. It is like putting the yoke on an ox so it would plow the ground. Although the ox does not wish to take this work on itself, we force it nonetheless. Similarly with the kingdom of heaven, we should also force and enslave ourselves because it is the Creator's commandment, without any rhyme or reason. This is so because man must accept the kingdom of heaven, not because the body feels that some benefit will come to it as a result, but in order to give contentment to the Creator. But how can the body agree to it? This is the reason why we must work, our, why the work must be above reason. It is called make for yourself a rav, since there should be the kingdom of heaven, because he is great and ruling. Okay, you know what, I'm going to ask you for a recommendation. All right? Would you guys prefer it if we like went through the article, or would you like us to divide it and then kind of like, you know, go through the paragraphs as they as they come along. Simply because I'm asking, because I'm in a bit of a dilemma, because I need to feel you guys as well, I need to feel how you guys want to interact with the material, because this material can be a bit, you know, it's, it's a bit heavy, and there are a lot of stuff in there that might be kind of like, you know, sounding a bit weird, <laughs> okay? Because Rabash wrote this like very, very, you know, a lot of years ago, and he wrote it inside a community uh, which was very familiar to this kind of language. But we're in the 21st century, and, you know, we talk a little differently. So if there's anything not, you know, not quite clear, you might want to go paragraph by paragraph. If not, I can read the whole thing and we can come back. So you guys let me know, and I'll go with exactly how you want to learn. All Looks right. like the mutual opinion here is dividing paragraph by paragraph. Oh, lovely, because that's exactly why I had in mind as well. So I'm glad we're all on the same page in frequency. So let's, let's do the first few paragraphs, okay? I'll go back to page 68 and we'll, we'll go together. In the Mishnah, Mishnah is a book, all right? So there's a guy called Yeshua ben Perachia, and he says, obviously he's a famous Kabbalist, okay? And he says, make for yourself a Rav, a great teacher, buy yourself a friend, and judge every person favorably. We see that there are three things here. One is to make for yourself a rav, buy yourself a friend, and judge every person favorably. This means that besides making for himself a rav, there is something more that he must do in relation to the collective. In other words, engaging in love of friends is not enough. Additionally, he should be considered towards every person and judge them favorably. We must understand the difference in wording between make, buy, and favorably. Making is a practical thing. This means that there is no mind involved here, only action. In other words, even if one does not agree with the thing he wishes to do, but on the contrary the mind makes him see that it is not a worthwhile deed, this is called doing, meaning sheer force, with no brains, 
since it is against his reason. Well, first of all, it's a good, good well, it's nice, isn't it? It's a no-brainer method, which I think we can all do. Okay, that's what he's saying, but we need to understand what does that mean, all right? So this paragraph is very important. In spirituality, we need to understand that we're going against our nature. Uh, we're going towards bestowal. And bestowal is, as we learned before in our previous um, semester, I'm, I'm hoping you already have, is against our nature because we're a desire to receive. So we want to take everything, right? We want to take and we, fit, we want to fill ourselves and we want to kind of, you know, really fulfill ourselves and not really do a lot of fulfillment to others. So what he's telling us here is in spirituality, it counts when you do things against your desire. Okay, so if I'm actually, I'm seemingly doing things, I want to do them, I'm running along and doing them, that's also great, okay? But what he's trying to tell us is there's going to be a time when you don't want to do something and you're going to have to kind of like overcome it and do it, all right? And this is the doing that he's talking about. Because if I want to already do something, it's not really called doing, is it? It's not really an effort for me because I want to do it and I'm running along with it and I'm a happy chap and that's how life's going. But in spirituality, doing, he's saying here, is, you know what? When I don't want to do this, but I'm like sheer forcing myself. It's like I'm getting up on Monday morning, okay? Tomorrow is Monday and it's work day. Not a very happy day for a lot of people, but I'm getting up and I'm going to work, okay? That's called doing. So same in spirituality, all right? So it's, it's just like our world, nothing different. And he's saying we're going to have moments like that. So accordingly, next paragraph, we should interpret in relation to the work, spiritual work, that the fact that one needs to assume the kingdom of heaven is called an act. So assuming the kingdom of heaven is the spiritual work, which is our study of Kabbalah, okay? So, it's like putting the yoke on an ox so it would plow the ground. Although the ox does not wish to take this work on itself, we force it nonetheless. So, he's giving a nice example here. He's making us look like an ox. And even though my body may not wish to do this work, I take it to work. Okay, just like I take it to work every day. So he's saying, you know what, when you don't want to do spiritual work, you should treat it like an ox. Put the load on and yalla, let's go. Okay, just like going to work on a Monday morning. Similarly, with the kingdom of heaven, we should also force and enslave ourselves because it is the Creator's commandment without any rhyme or reason. Okay, this may sound a little harsh because we know that the purpose of creation is for the Creator to do good stuff to us, right? That's the whole idea. I mean, He created the whole of reality so He could do good to us. And so seemingly, the Creator is commanding us to be slaves, okay? But He will answer that later on. It's not like how we think, okay? Enslavement here is not like how we think. We'll come to that in a moment. This is because man must accept the kingdom of heaven not because the body feels that some benefit will come to it as a result, but in order to give contentment to the Creator. In other words, He wants us to be enslaved to the attribute of bestow, which is love and giving, instead of being a slave to our current nature of self-love and egoism. All right? That's the whole trick. <clears throat> but how can the body agree to it? Well, this is the reason why the work must be above reason. It is called make yourself a rav, since there should be a kingdom of heaven, because he is great and ruling. So make yourself a rav means take the creator as a goal. Okay, making the goal very, very important. Just like if I have a goal, I want to make it important for me in this world, I also work on it. Same here. Okay? If I want to make a rough for myself, I take the goal, the creator, the attribute of bestowal as a goal, and that I make for myself very important. Make yourself a rough means, on top of the rough that we have, Dr. Michael Lightman, we have the goal. Okay? 
we're going to come to the tools to attain the goal in a moment. It is written in the Zohar, introduction to the book of Zohar, fear is the most important for man to fear the upper one <coughs> because he is great and ruling. The essence of the root of all the worlds and all and all are of no consequence compared to him. Thus one should fear the Creator because he is great and rules over everything. He is great because he is the root from which all the worlds expand and his greatness is seen by his actions. And he rules over everything because all the worlds that he created both upper and lower are regarded as nothing compared to him for they add nothing to his essence. So here we have one more thing. Sounds a little religious, doesn't it? Fear the Creator and be afraid of the Creator. Okay, now we've got this concept of being scared, okay, God-fearing, from religious teachings as well. So the reason I want to talk about it is because it has nothing to do with what they understand. Okay, fearing the Creator means, let's, let's try to measure everything from this semester onwards, actually, as fast as we can, towards our goal, right? So our goal is to attain the Creator, which is to attain His thought and His ability to bestow, we also want to get. That's our goal, okay? And once we reach that goal, we can live in eternity, perfection, utmost conscious existence while living in this world. So, he's telling us here, well, we need to fear God. Fearing God means that if my goal is to bestow, just like he's bestowing, okay, my fear is that I will not be able to get to that goal. That's the fear of God. All right, so don't think that somebody's going to fry us somewhere afterwards, all right, because there's no frying, all right? That's a myth, okay? I'll let you into the club with a few secrets now, okay? That fear of God means I'm afraid because I will not be able to love Him like He loves me. All right? Just like our children. We don't, we don't give birth to our children and say, well, if they do something naughty, we'll fry them in the pan. Okay? It's like, come on. Okay, so the Creator also doesn't create us, love us, and then think, oh, well, if they do something wrong, I'll just fry them in the pan. Okay, so the whole concept of the fear of God is that I will not be able to love Him like He loves me. All right, so now that we've got that cleared out, we can move on. By the way, any questions, just raise your hands. Therefore, the order of the work is for one to begin with make for yourself a rav, and take upon himself and the burden of the kingdom of heaven above logic and above reason. Okay, so he spells it out for us. So let's write that down. Rule number one. You can underline it here. Make yourself a rav. That's the first thing I need to do. Okay, make myself a rav. And go above reason. Make a rav and go above reason. We'll go above reason in a minute. Do I have a question here? I'll go for it, mate. Uh, by uh, oh, well, your, your name's not appearing there, but whoever's there on the iPhone, you can unmute yourself uh, and ask your question if you wish. Yep. Actually, uh, the, the instructor, instructor just answered, answered that. Question about um, fearing the Creator, creator but he answered, answered that. that great. That, that was, was great. great. So. <laughs> He answered answer my, my question, question before, before I could answer, answer it. There you go. Happens a lot. <laughs> I'm running fast, huh? Okay, no problem. That's good. <laughs> no, that was good. All right, let's carry on. There's actually another question here from Mary G. Mm -hmm. And uh, as well, you can feel free to write your questions. Not everyone has, has to speak them. Uh, in, a, in a previous lesson, fear of God was described as losing your relationship with God. Can you please explain that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's, this, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, uh, on the my iPhone, can you please mute again? I'm using it. Okay, there we go. Guys, we, once you ask the question, you must mute the microphones, all right? Let's not forget. Um, 
uh, that's no. actually the same thing. Um, if, I, if I really love someone, then I'm afraid to lose that relationship, aren't I? Okay, so it all depends. Relationship means, it's a good question. We have to, you know, in this world we get so confused with, with everything. What is a relationship? Do I love someone? Do they love me? Okay, that's even more important for us, isn't it? They need to love me. Okay, but if we think about it in spiritual terms, okay, spirituality is that I love them. Okay, so here with our relationship with the Creator is I'm fearing about losing that that contact with Him, okay, that relationship with Him. This is very important, and that's the fear of God. There are actually, in a relationship, just like in our world, you know, when we first, let's say, meet someone, as our relationship develops, and it gets stronger, 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 and more tight in bonding, we feel the fear of losing it more, maybe. Uh, but then in our world, you know, you never know until you lose somebody. Um, in spirituality, it's like every step of the way, it becomes very important for you. It becomes very sensitive for you. You kind of start to live around this notion that I, I have to be in touch with the Creator all the time. So it's, we mustn't lose that. And that becomes a fear. And then there's the fear of the Creator, and there's the love of the Creator afterwards in spirituality. Okay, there's two main steps in spirituality. One is the fear, okay? And the other one is the love of the Creator. So as we advance, the first thing is the fear of the Creator, which is to lose that touch, to lose that contact. All right? So we're talking about the same thing. Same thing. There we go. Hope that helped. Let's move forward. I'll start that paragraph again. It's very important here. Therefore, the order of the work is for one to begin with make for yourself a rav and take upon himself the burden of the kingdom of heaven above logic and above reason. This is called doing, meaning action only, despite the body's disapproval. Afterwards, buy yourself a friend. Buying is just as when a person wishes to buy something. He gives, he must let go of something that he has already acquired. He gives what he has had for some time and in return purchases a new object. Sounds a bit vulgar because I have to buy a friend, okay? But he's talking about giving concessions in a relationship. Like doing good things to each other, right? It is similar with the work of God. For one to achieve adhesion with the Creator, which is equivalence of form, as in, as He is merciful, you be merciful too, He must concede many things that He has in order to buy bonding with the Creator. This is the meaning of buy yourself a friend. So actually, there are, there are two aspects to this thing. One, I have the Rav and the friends. Okay, so that's one side of the story, one side of the coin. Okay, and on the other hand of the coin, I have the Creator and my relationship with the Creator. Okay, however, we have to note that currently I don't feel the Creator, I don't see the Creator, and I don't really have a relationship with the Creator. We have to be like, you know, smart about this and not create something in our imagination, otherwise, it will turn into some religious fantasy. And we don't want to be in Alice in Wonderland. We want to be very concrete in our approach to feeling the Creator. So what he's talking about here are two things. In one paragraph, he's giving us both sides of the coin. He's saying, listen, on the one hand, you have the Creator and your relationship with Him. On the other hand, He's not around at the moment. So when He's not around, how do I start the work? Okay? So, before a person makes for himself a Rav, meaning the Kingdom of Heaven... How can he buy himself a friend, meaning bond with the Rav? After all, he has no Rav yet. Only after he has made for himself a Rav is there a point in demanding that the body to make concessions, to buy the bonding that he wishes to give contentment to the Creator. Moreover, we should understand that he has the strength to observe, buy yourself a friend, to the same extent as the greatness of the Rav. 
This is so because he is willing to make concessions so as to bond with the Rav to the very same extent that he feels that the importance of the Rav. He feels the importance of the Rav. Since then, he understands that obtaining Dvekut with the Creator is worth any effort. So in order for me to come to making adhesion with the Creator a great effort, there are a few stepping stones that he's kind of talking about here. In a, it's a bit blurry, okay, but we understand why it's like that, because Rabbi Ash wrote it many years ago inside a community which is very different to ours right now. Okay? But it's all going to be clear in a moment. It turns out that if one sees that he cannot overcome the body because he thinks that he's not strong enough and was born with a weak nature, it is not so. The reason is that he is not feeling the greatness of the Rav. In other words, he still does not have the importance of the kingdom of heaven. So he has no strength to overcome for something that is not very important. But for an important thing, anyone can concede important things that he loves and receive what he needs. For example, if a person is very tired and goes to sleep at around 11 p.m., if he is awakened at 3 a.m., of course he will say that he has no energy to get up or to study because he's very tired. And if he feels like a little weak or has a slight temperature, the body will certainly have no power to rise at the time he is accustomed to rising. But if a person is very tired, feeling sick, and goes to sleep at midnight, but is awakened at 1 a.m. and is told, there's a fire in the yard, it's about to come into your room, quick, get up and save your life, in return for the effort you're making, he will not make any excuses about being tired, mindless or sick. Rather, even if he's very sick, he will make every effort to save his life, evidently because he will obtain an important thing. The body has the energy to do what it can to get what he wants. Now, this is also why we give up on many things in life, okay? We sometimes feel, you know, we can't do it. This is, you know, not in my capacity to do so and so on. It's not like that at all. It's because I don't have a desire for it. So if I had a desire for it, I'd have the strength for it. So he's saying spirituality is the same thing. If it's not important, it's not going to happen. So we need to make every effort to make it important so that the body, okay, is convinced that it can run forward and get this thing done. <clears throat> Therefore, while working on Make Yourself a Rav, a person believes that it is, for they are our lives and the length of our days. In other words, you know, spirituality is my life. It's kind of like Einstein saying, you know what, science is my life. It's like Picasso saying, art is my life. Okay? So, if we want to attain spirituality, Rabash is saying, listen, you've got to say, if you want to get this, you've got to say, spirituality is my life. Just like, you know, football is my life if I want to be Ronaldo. If I want to be something really good, somebody really good at what he does, that's got to be your life. And same with spirituality. For this reason, in all of man's work, in studying or in praying, he should focus all his work on obtaining the greatness and importance of the Rav. Much work and many prayers should be made on that alone. Okay, so work and prayer is a question mark here, okay, because it's different to what religions say. So, in the words of the Zohar, this is called raising divinity from the dust, which means raising the kingdom of heaven, which is lowered to the dust. In other words, one does not place an important thing on the ground, while something that is unimportant is tossed to the ground. And since the kingdom of heaven, called divinity, is lowered to the very bottom, it is said in the books that before every spiritual action, one must pray to raise divinity from the dust. This means that we should pray 
that we will regard the kingdom of heaven as important and that it will be worthwhile exerting for it and raising it to its importance. Okay? Praying is a pre-contemplation. Okay? So first of all, I need to understand, I need to think to myself why this is important for me, what I want to get from this. Okay? You might have also heard about intention. All right? So before we study, before we do anything with respect to our spiritual development, man has to think. He needs to ask himself this golden question. Why am I doing this? Why is this important to me? If I don't have a thought, a direction behind my action, it's like doing things instinctively, just like an animal does. So we don't want to be there. We don't want to be in that direction because we're already animals here. Okay? So we want to rise in degrees of man. So behind that action of spirituality, I need to put my intention, my thoughts, my desire. I need to give it that full oomph, you know, that push. So how we can understand, now we can understand what we say in the Rosh Hashanah, the New Year's. What we're just a second, uh, yeah. uh, all day 420 here is asking, what page are we on now? We are on page 71, second paragraph from the bottom. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Now we can understand what we say in the Rosh Hashanah, New Year's Eve prayer, give glory to your people. This seems quite perplexing. How is it permitted to pray for honor? Our sages said, be very humble. So, how can we pray for the Creator to give us glory? We should interpret that we pray that the Creator will give the glory of God to your people, since we have no glory of God, but the city of God is lowered to the very bottom, called divinity, in the dust. Also, we do not have the real importance in the matter of make for yourself a rav. Hence on Rosh Hashanah, the time when we take upon ourselves the kingdom of heaven, we ask of the Creator to give the glory of God to your people, for the people of Israel to feel the glory of the Creator, and then we will be able to keep the Torah and mitzvot in full. Ooh! A bit of a full paragraph here. Right. First things first. Rosh Hashanah is New Year. Okay? It's the beginning of a person's new state. Obviously, we're not talking about fireworks and crackers. We're talking about, when we say New Year, in spirituality, we're talking about the new phase that a person is going to commence, start. All right? Of spiritual development. Okay? And there are many, many ladders, therefore we have a Rosh Hashanah every year, because there are many years, okay? So in our spiritual development as well, there are many phases that we're going through, and a new phase for us is called a Rosh Hashanah, like a new year, all right? So we're not talking about like the celebrating of a new year, although we do that too, but we just need to relate everything to the goal, remember? What I said a few minutes ago, everything we need to start focusing now towards the goal, so our heads doesn't you know, our heads don't go somewhere else, like in this corporeal, all right? So, in the Rosh Hashanah, we have a New Year's prayer. So, we have a new desire in this new state that we are in. And it says, give glory to your people. And this seems perplexing. How is it permitted to pray for honor? As our sages said, be very humble. So, how can we pray for the Creator to give us glory? He's saying we should interpret that we pray that the Creator will give the glory of God to your people, that the Creator will give us some importance about the height and the glory of bestowal. Okay, the Creator doesn't need us to kind of raise Him up there somewhere. Okay, He's not in need of that. What He wants to do is the opposite. He wants to raise us to such a height that you know, we can be in His spot, basically. So, the prayer is a desire in us that wants to be, uh, wants to feel actually that spirituality is very important. That's the glory of God, means the glory of the attribute of bestowal. Because when we're talking about the Creator, right, we're not talking about some figure up there on the clouds like Father Christmas. 
All right? The Creator is a force of bestowal that governs the whole of reality. So what we want to do is attain that attribute. So a prayer is not I'm screaming out to someone that he's going to solve my problems. No, it's a desire that I'm building inside me to get to that height which right now I don't feel is as important for me. Okay, it doesn't feel like important because I'm living in this world and I want to attain things that I see in this world. This is what our body demands. So I have to kind of work on myself with the tools that I have in order to make this thing important. And that's the glory of the, keep, of, of the Creator. So he's saying, give the people, or is he saying, Creator will give the glory of God to your people. The glory of bestowal, the height of bestowal. And so this is called divinity in the dust. When it's not important for me, it's on the dust, all right? Because we don't, you know, leave things in the dust if they're important for us. So currently, spirituality is not that important. If I feel at this moment that spirituality is not important for me, it means it's in the dust. That's what he's talking about. So make yourself a rav. Make yourself a goal, which is very important. Okay? Hence, on Rosh Hashanah, the time when we take upon ourselves the kingdom of heaven, which is the spiritual work, the study of Kabbalah, we ask the Creator to give the glory of God to your people. We ask from the Creator, we want to have this desire that He gives us this greatness of attribute of love and bestowal for the people of Israel. What does that mean? To the people who are directed to that attribute. Israel means Yashar El, straight to the Creator. He's not talking about the Israeli out there on the street. He's talking about a person who has taken a direction, okay, straight to the Creator, and the Creator meaning the attribute of bestowal. Alright? And then he will be able to keep the Torah and mitzvot in full. It means that he'll be able to start correcting himself and doing things that he should be doing to advance in spirituality in full. Alright? Torah and mitzvot mean this. Torah is the light. Okay, we're not talking about the books here. Torah is also obviously the five books of Moses, but when we say Torah, we're actually talking about the sources where we can receive the light that reforms. Okay, that's called Torah. That's why Torah comes from two words. One is light, or, and the other one is Torah, okay, which is manual. So if I use the books, for example, we're using Rabash's book right now, Okay. If I use this book correctly and take the advice that he's giving us, it means this is my Torah, because I'm getting enlightened from this book. Okay, So we're studying right now the Torah of Rabash. Okay, There we go. Any questions? Nobody's asking questions? Come on. You break Anyone, you can raise your hand yeah. uh, on the. If you're on your computer, you have this raise hand little button there, and also on your phone, I just checked it out. If you click more, then you also have the ability to raise hand, and then we can see who wants to speak and call you out and, and unmute you if you want to ask a question that way. Otherwise, you can always ask a question in the chat. There's just a couple of little questions here. Uh, I'll just uh, quickly get through them. Kerry is asking, what is a Rav? Which was, this was early in the lesson. And then I think, uh, I can't, sorry, I can't remember who, but you answered that Rav is a teacher, which is partially correct as we continued the article. And then Mary G also raised that, that uh, partialness as a good question. So is the Rav a teacher or a group or both? And as we're learning now, so Rav, it's correct that it's a teacher. But uh, as I said, it, it, it's a partial response. As you see here, we're talking about make yourself a Rav. So Rav literally mean, means uh, the higher degree to myself. And what's always going to be the higher degree to myself? And what is myself at the end of the day? Myself is the will to receive, the creation. The higher degree to myself is the creator. We can learn from a Rav. We can learn from a teacher when that teacher is great in our eyes. So making ourselves a Rav literally means to make the Creator great in our eyes. So 
even though Rav is a, a teacher here in our world, it comes from this idea that the creator must be above the creation, meaning above the creation in its importance, in its value. And that's what we're talking about here, making ourselves a Rav, meaning it means raising that value of the creator to the utmost heights. So could the Rav be the group then? If I'm perceiving through the group uh, something greater than myself, something that I can learn from, something that I can attract the surrounding light through, something where the Creator, I feel the presence of the Creator and, and a, a place to advance spiritually towards, then definitely the Rav can be uh, within the group. We actually learn in our studies to more and more try to see that Rav in, in the group. Uh, the, the materialization of it is that, you know, we have a teacher who is called a Rav, and which literally means great one. But uh, that, that's where it comes from. That So the Rav is, is the creator that we always try to make important. I saw someone here, Oscar, I think, you raised your hand. You can feel free to unmute and uh, ask a question. Yeah, yeah. hi. Uh, so my question is about the Torah. Uh, so based on uh, your interpretation, can any reading material be interpreted as a, as a as Torah in that sense? When we talk about Torah, we're talking about um, authentic Kabbalistic material. Okay, and the authentic Kabbalistic material, though, think about it this way: if I have, for example, a you know material on the shelf, okay, and I'm reading them, but I'm not getting anything from them in terms of spiritual advancement. Is it for me Torah or not? Well, it's not, is it? So, when we're talking, we need to be very pragmatic. What do I get? We're a desire to receive and we have a goal. So, I want to attain something. In order for me to attain something, I need to be able to attain it from something, all right? Which is, which is the book we're studying right now. Okay, so, if a person is studying a book and he feels that he's getting the light from that, then for him that's a Torah. Okay. This also is a, is a good example from Baal Sulam when he was in his uh, when he went to his rav. On the shelf, he saw Ari's Tree of Life. He took the book, he opened the book, and he started reading it, and he said, "This is the book." Okay, Ari's Tree of Life. Okay, so and according to Rabash's little story that when he picked that book up and started reading it and said, yes, this is the book for me, it, he didn't know it was going to take him 20 years to really understand what the book was talking about. Okay. But he felt, he felt in his heart that, you know what, this is, this is the book. Okay. So for him, that was the Torah, Ari's Tree of Life. Uh, and that's why his whole, the, the whole Tas, the six volumes of Tas, is based on that book. So, yeah, if, if the person is attracting the surrounding light and attaining through that book, that book is his Torah. Okay, so right now, this social writings, Rabash's social writings, is for us. It's Torah. And you'll also often see Rav say in the lesson, we're studying Bala Sulam's Torah and Rabash's Torah. Okay, their teaching. Okay, I think you just answered the question from... Um who's here on the iPhone, and as well, all day 420 is just asking, is the Torah also known as the law? The halakha is known as the law, but that's also depending on what law, okay? You see, listen guys, let's, let's okay, let's, inter let's, <coughs> let's take a few minutes on that. Um, when we're studying the books and you see um, religious terms like Torah or the, the laws of God, you know, things like that. We have to start thinking about it in terms of our work, okay? Uh, and at first it's difficult. Um, in fact, it's difficult for quite some time, right? Sometimes I'm reading stuff and I'm thinking, what is he talking about? And then I kind of bring myself back to, oh yeah, we're, talk we're studying spirituality. And it happens. But what we have to do is start thinking about things a bit more pragmatically, right? Because we're 21st century people, you know, we don't, you know, we don't buy the things they were buying a few hundred years ago or a few thousand years ago. So for us, there is only one law, all right? We are a desire to receive, living under these conditions called life, and we want to suck everything from life 
in order to feel good. That's one law. So the Kabbalists are saying, listen guys, there's another law, which is the law of bestowal, and that's what the Creator is. And if we don't kind of balance ourselves to it, we're kind of feeling slapped around in life. So in nature, there's only one law, and that's called the law of balance. Okay? It's laws of nature. In nature, nature strives to balance itself. So, for example, when as humanity we do something unenvironmentally, you know, not so nice, unenvironmental, what does nature do? Well, he does an earthquake, he does a heat wave or a cold wave, and he kind of like sorts us out. Okay? Because nature doesn't have feelings. So, in nature there are laws that constantly balance each other out. And there is one law, and that law is called being in equivalence of form. And that's the only law. All right? And that's the only thing we need to keep, actually. Now, to know that law, yes, we're studying a lot, <laughs> including you know, six books of Tas and 13 volumes of Zohar. Yes, they wrote a lot about it. Okay? But it's because our nature is very deep. Right? We're very deep creatures. Although right now we're very shallow with just a desire to receive for corporeal things, all right, our nature has a very big potential to perceive the whole of reality. So the Kabbalists can't just stop themselves from writing so many volumes of books. So this is why we're studying them. But there's only one law. We keep equivalence of form as best we can in our work. All right? I think uh, Robert there, Robert in Dallas, you, you wanted to ask something? If you want, you can unmute. Hi, I'm just trying to figure out how to raise my hand. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. That's all right. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to explain it uh, on the um, on the desktop version of Zoom, or if you're watching on desktop or laptop. So if you click uh, the participants button, yeah, then you see the list of participants, and under it there's a little button there, and it says raise hand. And then if you click that, then you should. I just did it then, and then you see a little hand on the right there. And then after you've asked your question, or if you don't have a question anymore, then you just click the what it turns to like lower hand. There you go, everyone's raising and lowering their hand. Uh, on the mobile, if you're watching on the mobile, then there's a little button on the bottom right-hand side with three dots. You just click that, and then the, there's an option there to raise hand after, you, after you've clicked that. So that's basically how it works. Okay, anyone else who has a question they'd like to ask? Well, until then, I'll just carry on. Okay, also just before that, Lou, maybe just that we'll just use this as an opportunity. We just have a video clip uh, where Rav is also talking about this concept, Rav Leitman. So we'll just also just go into the video clip uh, and, then, uh, and then come back and carry on with the lesson. But the thing is simple. First, I have to choose the goal to which I have to reach. Choosing the goal means that I build for myself something that is great in my eyes, to which I will be directed, that this is what I have to attain. I have to get there. I have to grasp it. I have to unite with this. The Creator, the vision of the Creator, something that the person on the beginning of the path somehow at least in words, if not in inner sensation yet, but at least in words, he should depict himself. After you have made for yourself a Rav, that is, that I made for myself, I built for myself a sublime, important goal, that I want to reach this, that I'm willing to, for this to invest forces in all of my life, at least for the time being, that's what I tell myself that I examined according to all my mind and my emotion and everything that I see in life, there is nothing greater more that is worth more. Following that, 
I have to see by what do I get this great thing, which is called Rav. Rav means great. Then I need the friends, Arvut, the environment, study, the teacher, all that I need in order to reach that goal which is great in my eyes. Therefore, there are two stages. First, we build the goal and that I have to get there and then the means in order to attain that goal. This is clear. Right. Okay, good. Well, I'm glad. I hope that's all clear, right? So we have a goal and we've got the tools to get there. Lovely. Okay, now what we're going to do, we don't... We'll, in about 10-15 minutes, what we're going to do is we're going to move on to some questions and answers. Since you're not asking, we're going to ask now. <laughs> okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start reading a little bit, a bit more, you know, like flowing. Okay, uh, so if it's a bit too fast, you know why, because we're going to get to all of it at the end. All right, so make notes if you've got queries. Okay, and I'll be doing the asking. Right, so let's carry on. But if a person does not feel that life has meaning, I'm, I'm reading from page 72, second paragraph down, but. But if a person does not feel that life has meaning, many people choose to die. This is so because no person can experience suffering in his life because it is against the purpose of creation. Since the purpose of creation was to do good to his creations, meaning that they would enjoy life. Hence, one sees that he cannot be happy now, or at least later, he commits suicide, because he does not have the goal of life. It follows that all we lack is make yourself a Rav to sense the greatness of the Creator. Then everyone will be able to achieve the goal, which is to adhere to Him. And we should also interpret the words of Rabbi Yeshua ben Perechia, who says three things. Make yourself a Rav, buy yourself a friend, and judge every person favorably in regards to love of friends. It would make sense to think that friendship relates to two persons of the same level in skills and qualities, since then they find it easy to communicate and they unite as one, and then they helped everyone his friend, like two people who make a partnership, and each invests equal energy, resources, and work. Then, the profits too are divided equally among them. However, if one is superior to the other, meaning he invests more money or more expertise or more energy than the other, the division of profit is unequal too. This is called one-third partnership or a quarter partnership. Thus, it is not considered a real partnership because one is higher status than the other. It turns out that real friendship, when each makes the necessary payment to buy his friend, is precisely when both are equal status. And then both pay equally. It is like a corporeal business, where both of them give everything equally, or there cannot be a real partnership. Hence, buy yourself a friend, since there can be bonding when each buys his friend, only when they are equal. But on the other hand, it is impossible to learn from one another if one does not see that his friend is greater than him. But if the, but if the other one is great, he cannot be his friend, but his Rav, teacher, while he is considered a student. At that time, he can learn knowledge of virtues from him. This is why it is said, make for yourself a Rav and buy yourself a friend. Both have to exist. In other words, each should regard the other as a friend, and then there is room for buying. This means that each must pay with concessions to the other, like a father concedes his rest, works for his son, spends money for his son, and all is because of the love. However, there is natural however, however, there it is natural love. The Creator gave natural love for raising children, so there would be persistence to the world. If, for instance, the father would raise the children because it's a mitzvah, 
is a commandment. His children would have food, clothing, and other things that are necessary for children, to the extent that a person is committed to keep all the mitzvot. At times he would keep the mitzvot, and at times he would only do the very minimum, and his children could starve to death. This is why the Creator gave parents natural love for their children, so there would be persistence to the world. This is not so with love of friends. Here everyone must make great efforts by himself to create the love of friends in his heart. It is the same with and by yourself a friend. Once he understands it at least intellectually, that he needs to help and he cannot do the holy work to the extent that he understands it in his mind, he begins to buy to make concessions for his friend's sake. This is so because he understands that the work is primarily in investing upon the Creator. However, it is against his nature because man is born with a desire to receive only for his own benefit. Hence, we were given the cure by which to go from self-love to love of others, and by that he can arrive at the love of the Creator. Therefore, he can find a friend at his level. But afterwards, making the friend a rav, meaning for him to feel that his friend is at a higher degree than him, is something that one cannot see, that his friend is like a rav and he's like a student. But if he does not regard his friend as a Rav, how will he learn from him? This is called make, meaning a mindless action. In other words, he must accept above reason that his friend is greater than him. And this is called make, meaning action above reason. If the, necess if the essay, a speech for the completion of the Zohar, it is written in the essay to receive the first condition, each student must feel the smallest among all the friends. In that state, one can receive the appreciation of the greatness of the Great One. Thus, he is explicitly stating that everyone should see himself as the smallest among the students. And yet, how can one, how can one see oneself as the small, smallest of the students? Here only above reason is pertinent. This is called make yourself a Rav, meaning that each of them is considered a Rav compared to him, and he is regarded as merely a student. This is a great exertion, since there is a rule that the other's deficiencies are always visible, while his own faults are always hidden. And yet he must regard the other as being virtuous, and that it is worthwhile for him to accept what he says or does to learn from the other's actions. But the body does not agree to it because whenever one must learn from another, meaning if he has high regard for the other, the other commits him to labor, and the body revokes the views and actions of the other because the body wants to rest. It is better for it and more convenient to rule out his friend's views and actions so he will not have to make an effort. This is why it is called make for yourself a Rav. It means that for the friend to be your Rav, you have to make it. In other words, it is not by reason since the reason asserts otherwise and sometimes even shows him the opposite. That he can be the Rav and the other his student. This is why it's called make, meaning doing and not reasoning. Three, and judge every person favorably. After we said by yourself a friend, there remains the question, what about the rest of the people? For example, if a person chooses a few friends from his group and leaves the others and does not bond with them, the question is, how should he treat them? After all, they're not his friends, and, they, and why didn't he choose them? We should probably say that he did not find virtues in them to make it worth his while to bond with them, meaning he does not appreciate them. Thus, 
how should he treat the rest of the people in his group? And the same applies for the rest of the people who are not from among the people of the group. How should he treat them? Rabbi Yeshua ben Perachia says about it, judge every person favorably, meaning one should judge everyone favorably. This means that the fact that he does not find qualities in them is not their fault. Rather, it is not in his power to be able to see the merits of the general public. For this reason, he sees according to the qualities of his own soul. This is true according to his attainment, but not according to the truth. In other words, there is such a thing as truth in itself, regardless of the one who attains. There is truth that each attains according to his attainment, meaning the truth changes according to the ones who attain. Meaning, it is subject to change according to the changing states in the one who attains. But the actual truth did not change in its essence. This is why each person can attain the same thing differently. Therefore, in the eyes of the public, it could be that the public is just fine, but if he sees differently according to his own quality. This is why he says, and judge every person favorably, meaning he should judge all the others besides his friends favorably, that they are all worthy in and of themselves, and he has no complaints whatsoever concerning their conducts. But for himself, he cannot learn anything from them because he has no equivalence with them. Right, so we read quite a lot, a lot of stuff here. But just to put everything in perspective, in a nutshell, right? So we're going to do this in a... Rabash here is giving us the whole thing, all right? He has just spilled out the whole of the world, uh, whole, whole of, not all of the world, the, the whole universe. of the study, okay? So he told us everything what to do, bang, bang, bang. And we just need to make sure we grasp it in two minutes before we start asking the questions around here. Okay? So, one, make yourself a Rav. That's the first thing. Okay? That means that's the goal. Okay? So we need to have a goal. It needs to be crystal clear. And we need to make sure this is what we want to attain. So the Rav is the creator, but I don't see the creator. He's nowhere to be found. I'm left here with a few things. I've got a teacher, Dr. Michael Lightman. I've got the books written by Rabash and Bala Sulam. And I've got the group. Okay? So while the creator is not around, I've got a few things that I can bring together in order to make, in order to make this goal very, very important for me. Okay? Which is, make yourself a Rav. By yourself a friend. Okay, so buy yourself an environment basically. Buy yourself a friend, meaning, ooh, build yourself an environment. God, my spelling is a bit off today. Sorry about that. Let's do this. Okay. Buy yourself a friend. There you go. Okay, this is the environment. We have to build it. That's what it's talking about. When he says buy, you've got to work on it. You've got to you know, give from yourself. Buying, obviously, we're not talking about paying with money, but we're talking about paying for things with effort. All right? So buying, building an environment, that's effort. That's what I'm paying for. And the third thing is see your friends favorably. See your friends' good points. See your friends' good sides. All right? If they have a bad attribute in your eyes, he's saying don't see that. Okay? Don't fall into that trap. Just see them as, you know, good guys. <coughs> okay? <laughs> that doesn't sound too hard, does it? <coughs> All right? So we just got to see the good sides of our friends because he's saying if you see the bad sides of them, it's because in your eyes they look bad. All right, so it means that your eyes are not actually seeing the truth 
which is the last thing we read. He's saying, your eyes don't see the truth right now, and that's why you're seeing them as bad. So you've got to try to see their good sides, all right? And that's the whole idea. So there's a few principles here which we're going to elaborate on. Okay, guys, so around this time next week, meaning in the last half hour or so of the lesson, this is usually going to be the time when we'll be doing these workshops, meaning it's not going to be as it is now, where there'll be a teacher speaking, explaining, and asking the teacher questions and getting it answered. It'll be a bit different to that. That'll happen in, let's say, the first hour or so. And then in the last hour, what we're going to be doing is breaking out into Zoom's breakout rooms, where... Uh, it divides people into different rooms. So let's say now, for example, you'd have Kerry, Carmina, Carlos, Tim, uh, Francisco, and Maria Teresa in one room, uh, and Mary G, uh, whoever's on the iPhone, Angela, Paul, Lisa, Scott, Annie Bell, and Oscar in another room. It would kind of be like that. And then we'd be asking questions. And you'd be answering them in a workshop format. But it's very important that we discuss what is that workshop format and what are the rules of the workshop because that, that's what holds it together. And not just holds it together. We're not just here to have a nice discussion or anything. We, we do these workshops, as I mentioned, everything we do in the Wisdom of Kabbalah is to draw the Orma Kif, the surrounding light, and, and to give us uh, the ability to attain spirituality you know, faster and more readily. And, by connecting among our, each other in this way, uh, it, we, we find that it, it creates that sensation of connection. It, cre it creates a much stronger impact of the surrounding light, uh, simply because of that reason that in our root, in our soul, our soul root of Adama Rishon, we were all connected as one. So we form some kind of corporeal or physical manifestation of that oneness we have in our spiritual root. And there are some rules that we, that we have that, that hold that together. So uh, just to write a couple of these down. So the rules of the workshop or the, or the workshop rules. And usually, you know, even the first workshops and everything, all, all we'll be doing is discussing these rules among each other. Workshop rules. Uh, so one, you can summarize it as equality. Meaning that all participants are equal in the discussion. All participants are very important. Yeah, so just like if we're all connected in our spiritual root. So each one, it's like cells in a body or organs in a body, you know. Even though it might appear that, you know, one cell is more important or less important. It doesn't work that way. Every cell, every organ works for the benefit of the, of the whole body. And, and that's how we are, too, in the, in the workshop we, where we see each other. And, and it connects right back to this point that we just mentioned of judging the friends favorably. That we're always seeing the good points in the friends. That we're always, uh, that we're always having this focus. The second one is the, is the focus of the workshop where we discuss one topic at a time, or one topic per round. It's very important to keep to the topic. Otherwise, we can uh, really disperse from the, from the discussion. Again, this is also, you, you'll see often, if you, if you watch lessons, even our lessons, but the, the, the lessons Rav Leitman gives during, the, during the, the daily Kabbalah lessons, you'll see that he's very focused on one topic, it's, a, it's kind of like a spiritual attribute that there's a, that there's a single source and it comes down, you know, filters down into our world. And, and as the Ari writes, that there's a very thin line from this world to end sof to infinity. And it requires a, a very proper focus. That, and in our workshop situation, it becomes uh, materialized as, uh, as a question being asked and e each one really focusing on, on that one question. And, and, and delving deeper and deeper into the connection among each other and in the scrutiny of the question. Uh, three can be discussed as mutuality, where everyone shares their opinion. So, you know, there might be someone who likes, you know, being quiet all the time, 
but you know, each one has an opinion. It's, it's like everyone should feel free to be open and, and share their opinion. Just think of it like, uh, you know, as if we're one team, yeah? A basketball team or something like that. Uh, a basketball team, if you just have one player standing there idly doing nothing while the rest of the team is playing, so obviously that team's going to lose the game. You know, here too, we're, we're like a team, and uh, against us is our egoistic nature. And what we're trying to reach is our goal of, of becoming more connected, more bestowing, just like the Creator, to reveal the Creator among us. So it requires everyone's participation. And again, this materializes in the workshop uh, as everyone sharing their opinion. And we understand that there's, you know, people are, are very afraid, very ashamed of, uh, of, of things. So don't be shy, basically. Yeah, so you don't need to be shy. Uh, listening to others in the circle is also very important. Think of it like in, in lots of discussions, a person just waits for his turn to speak. In this case, it's not the case. You know, we, we, we really try to enter the other as if it's us speaking. You know? So now if Mutlu is speaking and he's after me in the discussion, in the workshop, so I really try to feel what Mutlu is saying the same way as if I'm saying it. And this really helps us connect that we're uh, at a deeper level, you know, usually at a deeper level we can say that we try to actually see the Creator through the friend. Like as we talked about in this article, we're, we're making for ourselves a Rav. We're making these friends that we're among in our group, we're making them important. So we're try and uh, judging them favorably. favorably. How do we judge them favorably? We, we look for that point within them which is, that which is speaking uh, from the point in the heart. We're, we're looking for that desire for spirituality that the Creator is, uh, is enlivening in the friend and that's what's bringing the person to this discussion. And we try to use our focus and, and listening to the other to kind of focus on, on this point where we're all connected at that most fundamental point among each other. So you can see here it's not just a discussion where you know a person speaks and then another's going, oh that's interesting. There's nothing intellectual about this discussion. It's a, it's a workshop, it's spiritual work to connect to this mutual point in the heart that we all share. And the listening part, you could even say, is much more important than the speaking part in this case. And the final rule is, could be summarized as acceptance. And as we said, some people feel, you know, we, we come from this world where we feel like we need to be smart and answer things correctly. There's no right or wrong in these discussions, meaning that the main focus is connecting among each other there, and therefore there can be no criticism of what other people say. Uh, no criticism. Okay, it's getting hard to write down here. Basically what Rabbi said, right? We always see the good side of the friends. Yeah. Judge everyone favorably. So that's basically we're at, right now in the in the in, in the workshop, we're basically applying what he wrote in this book. Okay, Marcos just translated all that into the 21st century. So that's what we're doing. We're all equal in the workshop, and everybody's important. Okay, um, we're all focusing on the goal because we have a goal, right? So that topic is around the goal. So we're making ourselves a rav. Um, mutuality means everybody's equal, everybody's sharing their opinion, we're buying our friends, right? We're giving concessions, okay? And we're flowing, we're listening to others. Listening to others is also giving a concession. Because in life, we don't really like to listen to other people. In life, we like everybody to listen to us, okay? But spirituality is the opposite, okay? So what we're doing is listening to others. So we're not doing anything extraordinary and seeing everybody favorably. Okay, so we're just basically doing everything that the Rabash recommended to us in a workshop. Okay, so this is how everything comes together. Don't think that these rules are any different than what we studied here. Marcos just did a nice translation so that we in our language, in our modern life, can understand it. Yeah, so as we said, we'll, we'll get started on that next week, doing actual workshops. Now we just wanted to more test the environment now, test the, test the Zoom. And we just wanted to throw a couple of questions out there and whoever feels like uh, you've got an answer for it. And just think, you know, everyone as well, we can already start practicing these principles 
according to what people answer, you know, just thinking that, you know, everyone here is very important and equal, uh, we're, we're, that we're just focusing on the question being asked, that one topic. Uh, everyone's free to share their opinion, to express themselves. When a person's speaking, really listen to them, like to what they're saying as if it's me speaking. And also the, ma the main thing is that there is no right or wrong. You know, don't think that you now need to like give the precise right answer or anything like that. And uh, there's no criticism of, of what anyone's saying. One thing I forgot to add to that is the, the workshop, the way that we go round and round in circles and, and answer a question, uh, in that way it, it builds this mutual answer. There's even been lots of studies recently in, in collective intelligence and, and these fields about the wisdom of the crowd where, where no matter how much a person can be individually correct or individually um, uh, in ex have excellence, the success of a group is always going to be greater and more accurate than, than the success of an individual. So, uh, so the more we, we practice these things and, and really work in this manner, where we more and more discover and, and see the fruits of our connection through this integral kind of response that we, that we develop together. So did you want to ask a question? What little? Certainly. How can we judge everyone favorably? Okay, this is a question, because generally when we look at people, we see their negative sides, and we go, ooh. Right. <laughs> so, how can we see what my friends are doing favorably? All the time. It's like they're perfect. Okay, Lisa. Lisa, you have something to say? Uh, yeah, I would say that would have to do with our egos and working on our own egos to um, that kind of create a wall and, and create um, a way of distorting other people and how we view them. Very nice. Uh, Kerry. The world is not what it appears to be. It is backwards from everything that we see. It is opposite. So when we see the create, when we see something that um, is bad, that we think is bad, and the creator is bestowing on us, when someone else does something that we think is bad, it's their way of bestowing on us. We just don't see it that way. Great. Don't forget to lower your hands after, after you've spoken and also to mute. I see that you mute very nicely. Come on, anyone else? How do we see uh, the friends favorably? Maybe I can uh, add to the question. You know, oh, here we go. Mary G. There you go. Go for it. Well, I don't know if I'm answering the question other than to say what a constant struggle. To see, even now, you know, with all that's going on in the world and how we see the tragedy in Dallas, I'm in conflict with friends that I truly love, but, but I struggle to not mm, see them in an unfavorable light, largely because they disagree with me. And I sit, you know, alone and say, oh, gosh, did I say something? Did I, was I harsh with them or what, what was I doing? So I'm not really sure how we can look at everyone favorably other than, you know, that vacillation, the, the good versus evil and how you see someone and you want to see them in a positive light. But holy cow, I don't know. I would like to ask the group, how, how do you do that? I mean, it's nice to say that, but what are the steps to get there? Okay, great. Uh, Josh, Josh from Nigeria just joined. Go for it. Okay, um, you can say the person favorably by imagining that that person is you, yourself. Not thinking like you are the person. So the way you see, you see yourself at that point means you will also be able to see. Did you just disconnect? I think so, yeah. Okay. We just lost him there. Just, lost, just, just a, a little bit of a response to, to Mary G. Uh, this is also one of the reasons we'll be starting the workshops and starting to work more as a group, because all these principles that uh, Rabash speaks about, 
uh, th these are to be practiced and exercised among the group, meaning among other people who have points in the heart and uh, uh, that, that we develop these things among each other. Uh, I understand like in the beginning stages we, we take these principles and, and we like to try to exercise them among our, our friends in life who, who don't necessarily have any desires for spirituality. You know, everyone, everyone goes through this. But what we'll see as well is that we, we will reach a lot of uh, difficulties if, if we're trying to implement a lot of these principles among our, our friends, you know, just from life or from our workplace or whatever like that. Because we will, uh, we'll just find that, you know, we're trying to work towards them in this kind of way and they're not working towards us in this kind of way. That's why we say that we, we exercise these things in the group, meaning among each other, the people who are here, people who share this common point in the heart and, and people who are exercising it and, and educating ourselves with it because there's a mutual atmosphere that we're trying to build and, and we have the ability to rise above our egos mutually because of this. We're, we're attracting the light together, we're working on these principles together and we have that ability. When you go outside of this, it's not like we're trying to give tips for life, you know, how to get along in the workplace, how to get along in, in life. These, these tips obviously once they're attained by a certain critical mass of people, let's say by the group, then the idea is that that light that, and that rising above the ego that they do, these influence other people, you know, at a deeper level, at a deeper level of consciousness and thought, etc. And, and it'll, it'll spread. But if we try to directly take these things out now and try to work with them, uh, with people who don't have these desires for spirituality and who aren't working on them mutually, uh, we'll, we'll find a lot of uh, clashes there, kind of like what, you, what you're experiencing now. We'll so find clashes in the group too, but there we have the ability to work with it and above it like, as well. Yeah, the work needs to be reciprocal, guys. Okay, so don't go out there and <laughs> start doing this with people who, who are not in the study. Okay, it's like we're, we're building like a, a, a team, okay, and we all want to play a game, uh, but we're not playing with the other guys because the guys outside don't want to play this game. So this is our team. We're building this team together, and this team's got to play with the book, play with the rules. It's All right? actually pretty nice. It's like we're playing basketball here, and then we're going to our friends who are playing football, and we're trying to play basketball with them on the football <laughs> field kind of thing. So you're going to be, uh, you know, it's going to cause a whole lot of mess. This is our fitness group, okay? So we're not mixing with other fitness groups. <laughs> okay. yeah. um, Oh, this is it. We're, we're reaching uh, the last couple of minutes. We just wanted to exercise that a little bit, like to to get into the uh, to just get into this mode, getting used to this format. Next week, we'll actually get into the the workshop itself, and, and we'll run it. See, Carlos, here you asked a question. It was uh, uh, we we didn't really get into it. It was a bit like on the side, but just in general, quickly, I'll just answer it. If if we don't make any effort to attain the Creator. Is there in life another direction that doesn't lead to him somehow? There is. It's the, the path of pain. Like, as we said, that there's the, path of the, there's the path of the light, where we make these efforts to rise above the ego with all these situations, to attract the light and to come to the Creator in a much more conscious and fast and pleasurable manner. And there's the path where we don't do that, and we're kind of just being... Uh, hit by nature from all sides and, and we're trying to kind of make our way the best we can according to whatever egoistic calculations are coming up in us all the time. So both eventually lead to the exact same goal. One gets there in a kind of more conscious, pleasurable way. Another one gets there in a, in a you could say... A, a beaten up way. In a beaten up way, yeah. In a slower kind of way as well. Uh, that's about it, friends. We'll, uh, we'll leave it there. We look forward to next week and the workshop will be running. Next lesson uh, will be the development of the soul lesson this Wednesday, July 13th at 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, it'll be in your usual EC classroom, so this coming Wednesday you'll be in the same place you usually go. Only the Sunday lessons here are going to be on, on Zoom. And as usual, any un un unanswered questions, you can go to the Q&A forum or any technical things, you can go to your email and send an email to ec at kabbalah.info. And that's about it for today. Thanks, everyone. It's been great seeing you and hearing you. Thanks, Mutlu. Have a good evening, guys. <laughs> See you next time.
have to wank it out.